So last time we saw that if you have a relativistic uh, harmonic oscillator like this red particle compared with a non-relativistic uh, harmonic oscillator like this green particle, you're going to get different uh, periods of oscillation. It's going to be drastically different. Here we've got a relatively weak spring stiffness and we've got a, a, an already noticeable difference in their periods. And the reason for that is that the speed has to top out as we get close to the speed of light. So the, the green curve doesn't have a speed limit, it's just a traditional sine curve. But the red curve uh, has to obey the speed limit of being less than the speed of light, which we've set to be one in this case. So that's why it keeps flattening out. And the stronger we make the spring, the more this red curve is going to flatten out. Um, and that's pretty interesting, but we limited our discussion to just one dimension where these two were uh, oscillating back and forth. Um, it's pretty easy to make a spring work in two dimensions. All we have to do is give it an initial velocity that's perpendicular to its initial position. So here we've got these two out along the uh, x-axis. Now we just need to give them a velocity component in the y direction and we'll get them moving around in pretty cool curves. So let's go over to their initial uh, momentum vectors. Um, so we're gonna give this one, for example, uh, let's, let's give them both the same initial momentum. Let's give them a, a momentum of one unit in the y direction to start out with. And so we'll hit control two. And so what you notice is that they start out going in the y direction and now the, the spring force is always gonna pull them backward in, what, in whatever direction they are, uh, they're, they're pointing away from the origin. Um, so like for example, right now the red ball is feeling a force pointing this way, green ball is feeling a force pointing this way. Um, and what you notice is that they're, they're both going around in these loops. The red uh, trajectory is a little bit contracted compared to the green ones. The green one gets a little bit wider arc. And again, that's due to the uh, relativistic nature. It's because the red one is experiencing this speed limit. We can go down and look at the uh, velocity component in the x direction. And you see that we'll get the, uh, the, the topping out of the speed again. So it's, it's not allowed to have as high of a speed. But another big difference that you can see in the uh, trajectories is that the green trajectory, we've hit upon a nice set of values that gives us a closed trajectory like this. The red one is not closed, so it's not tracing back on itself. It's tracing out a different path every time, which is pretty neat because this means that you could set up a relativistic spring and actually have a noticeable difference, even if you weren't uh, you know, taking any proper measurements. If you weren't actually measuring the position, you could just watch the thing and see that it's tracing out a broader arc than the green one is. Uh, let's play around with those values a little bit. Let's give them a little bit weaker uh, velocity. Let's give them, a, or momentum, let's give them a momentum of one-tenth of what they had before. So here we get a little bit more closer to an ellipse than a circle. Again, the green one gets to make this nice kind of closed loop. Um, the red one, however, does not make a closed loop. So again, there's a big difference here in that uh, it's not just that they're getting out different numbers, it's that they're qualitatively behaving differently. So this green one uh, gets to go around on a closed track. The red one uh, does not close back on itself. At least it doesn't close back on itself yet. I suppose we could watch this and see if it ever traces back on itself. Let's go to fast motion to see that. All right, I hope you'll excuse my little uh, transition there. I realized that uh, in order for this thing to finish running before I have to go to class this morning, uh, I needed to increase the animation rate of the simulation. We're coming almost on one complete go around for the red and we're looking to see whether it overlaps with its original trajectory. And let's see, so we just have to really look for whether it overlaps with the green again. Uh, it's coming close. It's going to do it, it's gonna do it now. I, let's see, let's zoom in. Oh, I don't think it did. No, no, it's not tracing back over itself. Uh, the animation is a little bit jagged because of the increased frame rate, but the accuracy is still good because of the, uh, the time step is still good. But no, I don't think this thing is tracing back over itself. So that would be something neat to try to see. Can you get the, um, the red relativistic particle to loop back around on its own trajectory or does it always 
uh, diverge from itself there. What do our graphs look like? Oh yeah, our graphs are a bit of a mess right now. Um, you notice that uh, the red one doesn't stay very consistent um, because, uh, again, this is just the x component of the position. I could graph the uh, magnitude of the position instead. Same thing with the speed here. You're gonna get the same idea there. Uh, but no, I don't think this thing is, uh, no, it doesn't look like it's tracing back over itself. There's definitely a gap between uh, the first set of trajectories and the second. So that would be a fun thing to see if you can do to try to get um, uh, try to get the, the red one to go back over on itself to get it a closed trajectory, or maybe that's impossible. Maybe that's uh, maybe relativity does not allow that. Um, so I think what we're going to do next time is shift gears a little bit, and instead of talking uh, so much about the motion of these particles, we're going to talk about other relativistic effects. We're going to take a look at length contraction and how the size of objects changes um, as we. Uh, get closer to the speed of light. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.